So the next presentation is from a guest from the United Kingdom, Professor Gavin Shedick, works at the University of Exeter, where, is, where he is the head of the Department of Mathematics and Professor of Data Science and Statistics. He has a long history on developing statistical models for environmental epidemiology. He is one of the authors of the Oxford Handbook of Epidemiology. And together with Jim Zydek, he has written a book on spatial temporal methods in environmental epidemiology. In, in this talk, Gavin will outline how dynamic micro simulations can aid in understanding the effectiveness of different mitigation measures um, to make sure that connection issues aren't troubling us. Gavin actually pre-recorded his uh, presentation and sent it to us. So uh, we will now uh, show that video. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, at, because Gavin is also here in person, you could, if you want, already ask them in the chat. Uh, unfortunately, the chat was accidentally closed in the last presentation, but it's open now. Um, and during the playback of the video, uh, Gavin could already interact with you. But if you want, it's also perfectly fine to wait until the end, uh, there will be time for uh, questions. So um, the video can start. Hello, and welcome to this presentation on incorporating time use and health data into a micro simulation model that we developed to uh, predict the development of the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK. A brief outline of the presentation. Um, A brief outline of the presentation. Uh, first, I'll describe the integration framework, the, uh, the way in which we bring together data um, from uh, spatial interaction models, from health surveys and time activity information, uh, together with a synthetic uh, population of the UK uh, to develop a, um, a method for developing probabilities of contracting the disease in different locations and we feed this into a SEIR model, an epidemiological uh, susceptible exposed infected and uh, recovered model. Um, I'll then talk about the importance of heterogeneity, how we incorporated uh, a great deal of information on individuals um, and at small area level uh, in order to um, populate our model and to allow us to look at the effects of transmission and the disease on different members of the population. Then I'll give um, details of the simulation framework itself, and then I'll end with uh, some results, uh, some scenarios in particular, what would happen if we'd had the lockdown, the first lockdown in the UK a week earlier, um, and what effects that might have had on different members of the population. And also then uh, at the end, briefly describe some potential future developments. So the integration framework is where we pull together data on um, individuals uh, and match that with information from uh, the Time Use Survey, Health Survey for England and Labour Force Survey so that we can get an idea of um, where people spend their time um, and what they do when they're in different locations. Now, the population we use is based on um, the outputs of the Spencer project, which is an Alan Turing uh, Institute project in trying to create a synthetic population of the UK. So for every individual in the UK, um, we have, uh, based on census information and um, other sources, uh, information on individuals, households, uh, which is then aggregated up to MSOAs, which are small areas, middle super layer, uh, open areas, um, and we integrate that underlying synthetic or virtual population um, with information from spatial interaction models, um, where people do their shopping, where they work, um, where they go to school, and how long they spend in those areas. And then by using micro simulation, we can have individual people moving around in those locations, and if they visit the location and they have the disease, they impart some hazards to that location. And then as other people go to that location, um, if the hazard is great, then there will be a higher probability that those new people um, get the disease. 
So within the integration framework, um, at the first stage or the pre-stage, we initialize the model. Um, individuals are assigned in, uh, a, in a disease status, and this will be whether they have the disease or whether they don't have the disease from the SEIR model. Um, and this is based on um, collaborations with the local NHS, National Health Service, um, in uh, Devon, uh, where I'm based at the University of Exeter. Um, and then in stage one, uh, hazard is allocated to homes, school, shops, etc. as individual people visit uh, those locations within the microsimulation model. Uh, they give hazard if they have the disease to those locations. And then the people who don't have the disease who go to those locations as well, they will be exposed to that hazard. So their probability of uh, contracting the disease will increase if there's a lot of hazard, i.e. a lot of people with the disease in the locations they visit. And the third stage is then to build that exposure model into a probabilistic form for our SEIR model. Um, the exposure scores are used uh, amongst other attributes such as vulnerability, age, pre-existing health conditions to estimate the new disease status for all individuals and also the severity of the disease. So I'll now briefly describe the spatial interaction models um, that are part of this process. Um, this is a method for estimating the probabilities that individuals in our synthetic population visit supermarkets, primary and secondary schools each day. Um, this is based on a cost matrix that is used to compute trip probabilities based on a network containing all roads in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and uh, it's based on the shortest path between uh, each pair of zones, and then we end up with a probability uh, that people spend their time in a particular supermarket or a particular school. Um, workplaces are actually much more difficult because there's many more of them, uh, and there are no definitive lists of workplaces. So we created virtual workplaces in each of, of these small areas, M MSOAs, um, for each employment type, which we were able to um, get by linking our synthetic population to uh, labor force surveys. Uh, and then we created commuting flows between those small areas uh, based on uh, information from the UK census. And then individuals in our population uh, are allocated to virtual workplaces according to their employment classification. Well, it's important that we acknowledge that uh, during the pandemic, um, certain groups or population groups were um, affected differently uh, than others, and also uh, that the spread of the disease was not the same over all areas. And so the traditional approach um, has been to use uh, demographic information, such as age, gender, and ethnicity. Uh, what we've done here is, um, is to add additional information um, on individual status um, based on uh, uh, existing health conditions and socioeconomic variables and also behavioral patterns. Um, uh, what activities do people uh, spend their time doing? How long are they at work? How long are they at schools? Um, how long are they outside? How long are they indoors? Um, how many people are involved in those activities? And also, how do people travel? Uh, is it public or private transport? And we, we obtain this extra information, or at least we attach it uh, to our um, synthetic population from the Spencer um, using propensity score matching. Uh, and we uh, use information from the Health Survey of England uh, to get health status and pre-existing health conditions and whether people are vulnerable uh, or not, and also uh, their activities uh, during the day, which we get by linking to the UK Time Use Survey. And this allows us to create a database of activities and um, health status uh, at the small area level, and then we allocate um, those scores to the individuals within the areas. And here's an example of the kind of data that we created. Um, detailed demographic, socioeconomic health and time use data at the individual level uh, by household by small areas. And we can see that um, we've got the proportion of time spent at home, the proportion of time spent at work, at school, shopping. Uh, we've got for each individual 
uh, and this is a probabilistic measure, uh, measure because of the propensity score um, uh, matching, um, we have uh, pre-existing health conditions. We see here cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, together with um, the core data within the uh, synthetic population, which is um, age, sex, uh, and uh, household information. And here's some uh, maps showing um, the distribution of some of those uh, variables that we've created. Uh, we can see the average time spent at home, um, which certainly shows some uh, spatial patterns. Uh, the average time spent at work, uh, the proportion of key workers uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, at least during the lockdowns, key workers uh, continued to uh, go to work and thus were travelling uh, and uh, potentially were, had higher um, exposure to the disease. Uh, and also the um, uh, combined measure of underlying health conditions. And we can see uh, in that underlying health conditions that in the southwest of England, for example, there are relatively high rates of existing health conditions, which reflects the uh, general elder population. And actually, when we look at our case study uh, later in the presentation, we'll be basing that in the county of Devon, which is in the southwest uh, and has an interesting mix of population, uh, as we'll see. And looking at Devon uh, specifically, uh, here we see the proportion of time spent at home, uh, proportion of time spent at work, uh, the percentage key workers, uh, and the percentage underlying health conditions. And we can see um, some areas in the north of the county and the south of the county, um, which are near the coast and very popular um, kind of retirement communities, uh, where the proportion of underlying health conditions is, is quite large indeed. Um, at some places being uh, in excess of 40%. So I'll now briefly describe our um, simulation framework for the disease transmission. Um, it's based on an SEIR model. We have a susceptible population. They become exposed to the disease. And then crucially, there are two different um, states. Uh, an individual person could be pre-symptomatic, um, leading to symptomatic, or they can be asymptomatic, which means they won't show any um, signs of the disease and thus they wouldn't be expected to change their behaviour. So they would still be out and about going to school, going shopping. Um, the assumption is that if someone is symptomatic, there is a high probability that they will actually alter their behaviour uh, and thus um, become less of a risk to other people. Or in our model, um, there's less probability they will impart hazards to different locations. Each individual uh, on each day has a probability of becoming a case based on the exposure score, um, which is in turn based on where they spend their time and the hazard or at those locations, and, and which translates into how many other people were in those locations who had the disease. Um, uh, and that's a Bernoulli trial. Um, it's a, a slightly more complex function than the one shown, but essentially it's a uh, logistic regression. If someone uh, is exposed to the disease, um, then they will be um, pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, and the length of times that they are in those states uh, is based on a Weibull distribution with the parameters uh, estimated based on um, previous data analysis and from the literature, which is uh, constantly uh, being updated. Our symptomatic individuals will, will change the behaviour with a large probability, so it will be expected that the majority of them um, would essentially stay indoors and thus stop imparting uh, hazard to locations. Um, and the length of time that they're symptomatic uh, follows a normal distribution. And our asymptomatic uh, people carry on their lives as normal, uh, and that's where they go to locations, shop, schools, etc., and they will impart hazard um, and thus increase the exposure of other people in those locations. Um, the asymptomatic and symptomatic people, after a, um, a period of time, which is based on probability of distributions again, uh, will be removed. Um, whether they are removed, as in... Um, go back into the community, it is assumed that people won't get COVID twice, uh, or whether they 
uh, unfortunately die will be based um, probabilistically again based on their age and their um, health condition. So now we're going to look at some scenarios, some case studies, um, and we're going to look at uh, the case of Devon, um, county in the southwest of England, um, and we're going to uh, essentially run the model uh, twice, uh, once with lockdown, uh, the time that it was uh, in reality, and then again with lockdown being a week earlier to see what the difference might have been. So before we start, we'll just um, look at kind of sense checking the model and the data. Um, at the time in the UK, uh, we had to use what were known as Pillar 1 cases, which were reported by Public Health England, uh, and they were essentially hospital cases. Uh, we talked to our um, uh, clinical team um, to try to estimate the delay between someone getting the disease and becoming one of these cases where that was essentially hospitalization um, and they also helped us to uh, estimate what the overall prevalence would have been in Devon which at the time was thought to be about two percent uh, and over what time periods we should be looking. So we seeded the first 10 days of the model uh, based on this information and you can see on the right hand side um, these are the number of daily cases these PHE Pillar 1 cases uh, over time uh, where there was an increase and then lockdown kicked in and there was a decrease and, and below that's the cumulative number of cases in the county. And then we had to introduce lockdown to our model um, and we did this by using Go Google Mobility information. Uh, we looked at trends in community movement over time and on the right hand side we can see um, the difference in uh, time use in terms of being at home or outside the home during the lockdown based on Google Mobility data and we can see a, a clear marked decrease in the time spent outside uh, starting just before the actual lockdown date and then continuing during lockdown and then uh, as people began to come out of the lockdown it increased again. So uh, on, in this graph the baseline represents a normal value for each day of the week um, and uh, what we see is the median value for the five-week period, uh, January 3rd to February 6th, 2020, um, and that's the, the baseline. Um, and then we look at uh, the changes uh, just before and during lockdown. And here are the results. Um, this is uh, if our predictions, if lockdown had been implemented one week earlier, um, and we can see in grey uh, the baseline, which was essentially lockdown introduced the day that it was, um, and then in the orangey colour we see the results um, if it was uh, introduced a week earlier. Um, we'll see lots of different lines here because this is a simulation model that's run many, many times, uh, and what we, in the dark lines, are the medians, uh, and the dotted lines are the 97.5 and 2.5% uh, quantiles. And see, we, we see a, a clear difference both in the size of the peak um, with a reduction if lockdown had been a week earlier and also in the uh, location uh, of the peak and the, uh, a much quicker decline uh, and recovery uh, in the orange case. And as we have the information on individuals and what happens to them, we can look at uh, the effect of that scenario on individual um, age groups, for example. Uh, and we can also track at any period in time how many people are in each of the states in the SEIR model, exposed, pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, symptomatic. Uh, and so we can look to see whether there were differential changes um, in members of the population uh, with different scenarios. And here is uh, another way of looking at that data. This is if lockdown had been implemented one week earlier and we can see uh, again smaller numbers uh, of infected individuals um, and infectious individuals uh, and also we can look to see whether there are any spatial patterns in the differences uh, between the two scenarios. So we've seen um, an example of the model uh, being applied in the county of Devon. Um, currently, uh, we are running the model uh, covering the entire UK, um, which 
the Spencer uh, synthetic population is actually available for the entire you know, United Kingdom. Um, we, do, we had to do the propensity score matching, uh, which is rather a large undertaking uh, for the entire uh, country, and also check to see, again, whether um, we did a validation exercise on the propensity score modeling for um, Devon, quite a detailed assessment, um, which we're now doing for the entire UK. Um, it allows us and has allowed us to look at the effects of local outbreaks and lockdowns and, and particularly in the, the southwest, which is uh, um, heavily reliant on tourism uh, in its economy. Um, we were asked uh, by the local NHS to investigate what would happen if different populations came to Devon, which throughout the pandemic have had quite low uh, rates of the disease. What would happen if large groups of populations from areas with higher rates um, were to mix with the local population, um, what would the effect be? So another way of saying this, what happens when two R numbers collide, a low R number and, and a, and a um, smaller R number, and we were able to run the, the simulation model and assess um, how mixing of different populations uh, might affect the transmission of disease. And also um, this relates to the impacts of different shielding policies. Uh, so we have information on vulnerable people defined by their pre-existing health conditions, um, what would be the effect of either relaxing or tightening the rules on um, shielding, um, and also uh, bring things uh, very much up to date. Uh, it allows us to assess the balance between releasing control measures um, coming out of lockdown and the vaccination program. So what is the optimal uh, point at which we can um, release um, lockdown measures and uh, have people go back to work and back to school against the rollout of the vaccine, uh, which might be different in different areas. Thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to the opportunity to discuss this work with you and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Gavin. Um, it was a really nice presentation. Uh, Voice uh, or sound was a bit um, low, but uh, everyone was able to turn out turn up their volume and uh, could hear it well, so that was fine. It was really impressive. Um, anyone with questions? I noticed a few questions were already happening in the chat, but there are still uh, uh, about five minutes for more questions. So uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have uh, additional questions. Casper, could I just answer? Yeah, sure. um, Frank's point, which might be easier to explain in person rather than in chat. Um, <clears throat> I think Frank has realised that running that model on 65 million people simultaneously would be quite a computational challenge. Um, and I, uh, it's not admitting it, but at the moment we're at the stage where we're running it on different regions separately, um, building up the courage really to try to run the thing on the whole of the UK. Uh, and, and one of the things we've looked at actually is taking a sample um, a representative sample of the population from the entire UK and seeing um, at what point at the moment, at least computationally, uh, things break down. But, but, our, but our ultimate aim is to run the thing on all 65 million people, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, thanks for the explanation. Um, I don't see uh, any hands in the chat, so let me ask a question myself. Uh, suppose we were um, going to... Uh, uh, wanting to uh, apply the same model over here in the Netherlands. Uh, of course, a, a major difference between our country and the UK is the UK is an island, so all the international travel, you know exactly where the points of entry are, etc. And, and over here, even though it's discouraged, uh, especially people living close to the border still visit friends or family on, on the other side of the border in Belgium or Germany. Um, how more much more difficult be, does it become to model these things if your region isn't a, a closed region um that's a really good question and again it probably relates to that computational um uh aspect the easy answer would be well include all the neighboring countries as well <laughs> um we were we were lucky in many ways not just are we in Ireland, but actually during lockdown, there's only one airport in the southwest of England. So mm -hmm. those people returning from Italy skiing holidays. Um, and we actually saw the breakout of the um, the uh, pandemic in Devon was actually um, largely in affluent um, individuals and households in, in the kind of 
um, extra area at the beginning. I think if you were running for another country, I, and it'd be interesting to see actually, because we built this on a combination of a framework, trying to make it as generic as possible, but also on the data that was available. So we have this Spencer um, data set, which is this synthetic population of, um, it's essentially census, uh, but it's it's anonymized for obvious reasons. And then we've matched other data. I think that probably is possible in other countries. Um, the propensity score matching as long as you know there's time use information things the the flowing in and out of countries i think the the way we did it originally in devon we were tasked by the um medical director of the local nhs uh, where there were people from other areas of the uk with higher rates of infection and larger r numbers to see what effect that might happen and i think what what we did there was essentially um planted cases, um, not randomly, but in, in the areas, in the tourist areas. And I think you could do the same thing. You could make an assumption or maybe some data on transport between the countries and then kind of highlight the areas where those, those people might be. So it, it is really easy to actually drop cases in uh, and, and then let it run through. Thanks. Um, I noticed there were two questions. In the, uh, the first one probably is easy to answer. That's from uh, Jacqueline Norman. Are the data publicly available? Uh, question, yeah, that's a really easy one. Yes, um, uh, all of it, except for, no, it is all available now. Actually, the PHE case is all available. The Spencer is uh, open source. Um, all the, yeah, uh, everything's available. And, and if anybody's interested, our code is, uh, it's open source. It, it, whether it is as easy to read as we like to think it is, is another question. That's, uh, that's very good to hear. And then I think the last question we have time for before the break is uh, the one uh, Wouter van Amsterdam asked, it's, is the model amendable to stochastic gradient descent optimization? So I think it is. And it's something that um, we, as I'm, uh, and actually if, if, if I'll pronounce this wrong, if Wouter um, uh, was interested in carrying on this discussion, I'd be really interested to, because um, there are two ways we've approached the computational challenges. One is, more and more cloud computing uh, and the other of course is to just get more intelligent about actually how we run the thing and i think that's something um that we've we've started to think about um but we haven't really progressed uh, that far unfortunately okay um thank you uh, there was a last uh, clarifying question from sixa brower uh on the slides with simulation outcomes and labels baseline versus lockdown one week earlier is the solid gray line label baseline what happened um, in reality? Yeah, so um, but that, that, that's a good point, actually. Baseline was, uh, it happened at, that's the simulation run at the oh, at the time that lockdown actually happened. It's a good point. That's probably not labeled particularly clearly. What we ought to do is actually overlay what really happened in terms of cases as well. Um, and so we probably need three curves there. But that, that graph showed the difference between what we believe would have happened if everything had been done a week earlier, which suggest that things might have been better. We also ran it uh, a week later as well, um, which gives uh, the opposite results and, and quite dramatically uh, worse results, actually. Um, well, thanks for your presentation and your uh, answers to the questions.